morning. As Jeff said, I am not Jeff. Um, which is good for you. Which is good, you know. Actually, Jeff and I, I, this has been a wonderful experience working with Jeff um, on this sermon. We complement each other very, very well. Um, but it will not be your normal sermon because professor. So there's going to be a little bit more of an academic feel, and I hope that won't be too bad for you. Um, so yeah, I'm actually a biochemistry professor at St. Cloud State, but a couple years ago I felt the call to go to seminary. Um, and earned a Master's of Arts degree in systematic theology. And systematic theologians look at scripture from virtually every perspective, logic, philosophy, science, arts, language, um, trying to tie it all together. Um, and it was the most wonderful two years I have had in my life. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and as Jeff and I were preparing this series on Hebrews, we got this idea that, you know, maybe it'd be fun for me to introduce the book, to give you a sense of the scope, to give you a sense of the context in which it was written, and then I'd pass the baton off to, to Jeff, and he would run with it next the next few weeks. Um, and I don't know about you folks, but I need a slight prayer before I get started. So. Um, dearest Lord, your word is a joy to our hearts and to our souls. Let your spirit flow through us this morning so that we may come closer to you by understanding these words that were written so long ago. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's set the stage. When was Hebrews written? Okay. And this is sometimes a surprise that Hebrews was written prior to the Gospels. We know that it was written after Christ, but from some references in the text, we know that it was written, or we believe, we don't know anything. I, I should say, we do not know, right? But we believe it was written before the destruction of the temple, which occurred in 70 AD. Right? The Gospels were written later. So when the author of Hebrews refers to Scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament, not referring to the Gospels. Jerusalem is still under Roman occupation. Okay. Judaism is a recognized, or state-recognized, we could even say, religion, and therefore it is protected from persecution. And in the initial growth of Christianity, it was a sect of Judaism, and it therefore was protected. As it began to separate from Judaism, there began to be persecution. So it began to be difficult to be a Christian. We also found that because of this persecution, that fervor for Christianity that we see in Acts begins to fade. And the churches that had grown and were so excited in the initial stages began to shrink. People began to doubt, began to turn away. So this is the setting. This is what Hebrews exists to address. Now, Pastor Jeff and I were brainstorming about a modern example that could give you a sense of the excitement and then the sadness when something didn't happen the way it was expected. Because the early Christians expected God, or Jesus' return to be imminent in their lifetime, right? And it was going to bring, or it was going to take away pain and suffering. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. In fact, more suffering came. Now, I was thinking of Fleischmann's discovery of cold fusion, which happened in the late 1980s. Um, luckily, Jeff, before I could even get that out of my mouth, suggested sports analogies, <laughs> right? This is why Jeff is a pastor and Bruce is a nerd, right? Um, so here we have some sports analogies, right? 2004 Yankees, well, they are up three to one over the Boston Red Sox, three games to one. It is the ninth inning. They are winning. They threw it all away, right? 
and then lost the next three games, and the Red Sox went to the World Series. I'm not much of a golfer, but this second one breaks my heart. Right? The first Frenchman to ever have the potential to win the British Open could have shot a double bogey on the last hole. He went into the water and shot seven and did not win. And then the final one is a little closer to home. In 2006, the Minnesota Gophers were in a bowl game. Up by the delightful margin of 31 points at half. Then they took a nap. And Texas Tech came back, tied it, it went into overtime, and they lost. We do this because most of us have a flop story in our lives. Maybe it's a work project. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a friendship. Maybe it's something else. Okay? Something we had very high expectations that went unrealized. And I hope that that will give you some empathy for the early Christians as they, again, looked for the return of Christ. Didn't happen. That is what the book of Hebrews is intended to address. Right? The book of Hebrews is not so much a letter as a sermon. Probably one of the best sermons ever written. And its purpose is to support and challenge those early Christians in this time of difficulty. Cling to your faith. Cling to the promise of Christ. Don't turn back to what you knew. It's not easy. Christianity was beginning to look like a flop. I have a rabbi friend who likes to jokingly tease me. Christianity was just a failed apocalyptic sect of Judaism. Right? Apocalypse means Christ is going to come back. There's going to be a major change. Right? So just, yeah, just a failure. Right? Y'all are just kind of chasing this thing. One thing that's been extremely helpful to me. Um, Craig Kester is a New Testament professor at Luther Seminary, and he has translated and, and studied Hebrews, and he's proposed this structure for how the book is organized, right? So he's, he has an interest in rhetoric, which is formal speech making, and he argues that the book of Hebrews has specific pieces that are there to encourage the audience in, I, I, I hate to say manipulate with speech writing, but to some extent you are. You're appealing to the mind and the heart of the audience in various ways. Okay. So it begins with what we call an exordium. Its purpose is to engage the reader or the listener. Okay. Then there is a formal proposition and I encourage you to read ver or chapter 2, verse 5 through 9, because that tells you what the author is going to argue for the rest of the book. It's then followed by three formal arguments and an insight that Kester provides that I think is wonderful. At the end of each argument is what we call a transitional digression, which is a big way of saying the speaker knows that people get bored and they start thinking about other stuff, right? And so what you'll find at the end of each of these sections is something that's a little tangential, a little challenging, and a little emotional. It's really kind of cool. And then at the end, we have an emotional summation. So you'll find that the language changes from being kind of formal and academic to much more heart-type language. And then it ends with a what's called an uh, epistodal summary, um, kind of a postscript, you know, we're thinking about Timothy, we're hoping to be with you soon, those sorts of things.
Our reading today is the beginning of the exordium. And we can look at the first two sentences and realize that one addresses the past and one addresses the present. So our reading begins, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. And I've just chosen a couple of examples. This is from Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the, the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses! Moses, and he said, here I am. A very different example from the book of Isaiah. In the year that the commander-in-chief, who was sent by King Sargon of Assyria, came to Ashdod and fought against it and took it, at that time the Lord had spoken to Isaiah, son of Amoz, saying, Go! And loose the sackcloth from your loins, and take your sandals off your feet. And he had done so, walking naked and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years, as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as captives, and the Ethiopians as exiles. Both the young and the old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. So what's going on here? Okay. At this time, Israel was under control of Assyria, who was the power in the Middle East at the time. Okay. Many of the Israelites believed that an alliance with Egypt and Ethiopia would allow them to kick the Assyrians out, and have their independence again. Right? Isaiah is doing performance art. Right? You know those people who go on street corners and do crazy things. Right? Prophets do that kind of stuff. He walked around naked for three years to tell folks, hey, not a good idea to have forge this relationship. This is what's going to happen. So what are our messages? What do we learn from Moses? We learn that when God speaks to us, often we're called to turn aside from the path that we think we're on. Like a biochemistry professor being called to go to seminary. Right? What do we learn from Isaiah? Put on sunscreen. Put on sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Sorry, Bruce. No, don't. Do not apologize. I, I, you know, a little comic relief, right? Because we're about to learn that God calls us to do uncomfortable things. Like being a biochemistry professor at St. Cloud State, called to talk about his belief in the sacredness of Scripture. I feel naked pretty darn often. Um, The author goes on to say, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by a son. We don't often realize how profound that statement is. All of the folks we've been talking about in the Old Testament, and by the way, believe it or not, Moses and Isaiah are kind of normalish examples. The Old Testament has talking donkeys right? And it has hands writing on walls, and it has people being taken to valleys of bones. It's a crazy place, right, to look at how God speaks to us. They're all servants 
Moses is a servant of God. Jeremiah, Isaiah are servants. In the ancient Middle East, a servant can be respected, even loved. It's not a son. A son is an heir. And if you didn't catch it, the very next line, whom he appointed heir of all things. And if you haven't figured out that the author is really impressed by the majesty and incredibleness of what Jesus has done, then we go on. Through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things through his powerful word. We're good. Okay. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And that is just the first hundred words of the book of Hebrews. So I appreciate, or I hope you appreciate the ride you're in for, okay? The exordium is like the first hill on a roller coaster where you are being ratcheted up higher and higher and higher until you are let to go through the exhilaration of the arguments. It is a tour de force in speaking. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to a short phrase. He sustains all things by his powerful word. Because the world has changed, modern readers will kind of gloss over things that to the ancient reader were incredibly powerful. The ancient Hebrews believed that God sustained all of creation what does that mean? That means if God wanted to end the universe, he doesn't have to get a cosmic wrecking crew, right? He doesn't flip the switch and let it decay. When God says the world or the universe ends, it's done immediately. That's a core belief of the author of Hebrews that Christ sustains all things. That belief actually has meaning for us today. And I'd like to share a couple things from seminary and then I am almost done. So, Martin Luther noted that humans struggle with gospel. We're really good at law. We like structure. We like to do lists. We like to be told, good job. You did well. Right? So we, are, we gravitate to law because law tells us what we need to do. The problem is, is when the law is humanly unattainable. And as an example, we have this difficult reading from Matthew. He said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Interpreted by law in a modern so society that likes to compartmentalize, oh, I can't talk now, compartmentalize our lives, right? We say, oh, this is my work stuff. This is my family stuff. 
Is my church stuff just my fun stuff? Huh? That is really hard teaching when you start seeing the word all. However, and I encourage you to do this, if you accept this proposition that Christ is in everything and everyone, you will be convicted that it's not possible to separate the lovable and the unlovable as you see them in the world, but is a tool to become more like Christ and to see the lovable in all. All is a very big word. All right, now I am truly almost done. We are no longer, if you take that proposition from Hebrews, you are no longer in a world where you're trying to fix yourself and fix those around you. You're in a world where you are discovering what God is doing in everything. And this psalm then becomes a delight. Go out and taste and see that the Lord is good. And invite more friends. Amen. Shadows have vanished and darkness is banished as forward we travel from light into light. God rules all the forces, the stars in their courses, and sun in its orbit obediently shines. The hills and the mountains, the rivers and fountains, the deeps of the ocean claimed God divine. We too should be voicing our love and rejoicing with glad adoration, a song let us raise. Till all things now living, unite in thanksgiving to God in the highest, Hosanna and praise. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Lord God, we give you thanks today for the witness found in the book of Hebrews, uh, a book that is really a sermon, a sermon for people whose faith was hot, so exciting, so at the top of the roller coaster, but then whose faith began and started to, to fade and to struggle. And that can happen to all of us, Lord God. And so the writer of Hebrews began with these words, began to preach, saying, in many and various ways, God once spoke through the prophets, but now, 